All right, what we're doing today. We're gonna do nucleic acid today. So we're gonna review some organic chemistry and it's gonna be awesome. It's organic chemistry that you actually need to know, organic chemistry in practice. So we'll do nucleic acids. We'll talk about how nucleic acids are built, how they're polymerized, how they're structured together in DNA. So we'll talk about the double helix and then we'll start talking about genomes a little bit, uh, huge polymers of DNA and, and the information they contain. So we talked last time about the central dogma of molecular biology. So we're gonna kind of work through this a little bit. So today we're gonna spend most of our time talking about DNA, talking about nucleic acids and how they're put together. And as the semester evolves, we're gonna keep talking about how genes are expressed in the form of RNA and we'll talk about protein regulation. Um, so this is where we're going, but we're gonna start and just talk about DNA today. I know we're talking organic chemistry and structure, but I really do want you guys to interact today. So if you have questions, if I'm going too fast, if you have issues, I really wanna talk about this. So I'll probably get off and get excited. Um, so don't let you, that stop you from asking questions, all right? All right, at the heart of DNA is sugars. Uh, DNA is not just sugar, but it's got sugar molecules in it. And the backbone of DNA is made up of sugar and phosphates. So I'm gonna review uh, pentose sugars. So a pentose sugar, uh, unlike glucose, glucose is a hexose sugar with six carbons. Uh, DNA is made up of pentose sugar, so five carbons. And it's important to know the structure and be able to name the carbons. So you need to be able to draw a pentose sugar. You're gonna be able to need to uh, name the carbons and know the difference between DNA and RNA in terms of their molecular structure. So uh, when you're numbering the pentose sh sugars, uh, you start with the first carbon next to the oxygen in the ring, okay? So find the oxygen in the ring, the carbon next to it is going to be the first carbon. So we have carbons one, two, three, four, and the fifth carbon hangs off and is not part of the ring structure, okay? So this pentose sugar is a five member ring. There's five things in the ring, but the last fifth carbon isn't participating in the, in the ring. It's kind of hanging off as a little flag, okay? So it's an asymmetric molecule. Uh, ribose, this, is, this pentose sugar is ribose, and it's got the typical molecular structure. It's a true, um, true sugar. Uh, it's got, uh, what's the term I wanna use? Uh, sugars are, carbohydrates, so for every carbon there's also a water, right? Carbohydrates, so for every carbon there's a water molecule, an OH group and, a, and an H group, so together you got an H2O, right? In ribose, every one of the carbons, you can account for a water molecule, uh, except for the one in the ring, because we've lost an, a hydrogen here, and so it's now forming a, a bond with the first carbon. So in ribose, the second carbon has got an OH group. In deoxyribose, you just have lost the oxygen. So it's the only difference between DNA and RNA in terms of the, uh, the sugars. There's other differences that we'll talk about, but a deoxyribose is just missing that oxygen there. Basically doesn't make any difference for the solubility of the molecule, the way the molecule acts, the way that polymerizes. Um, Ribose and deoxyriboses can be put together. You could make a weird polymer that had both RNA and DNA nucleotides in it. So these sugars are compatible. Um, it actually does make a big difference though molecularly in your cell because the proteins that grab these things recognize whether that oxygen's there or not. So it actually is a very distinct difference in terms of how your cell uses them. RNA and DNA are used for very different things. Um, but in terms of like, I don't know, chemical properties, they're virtually identical. Uh, you could link these two carbon, or these two uh, sugars together. We could link and make them a disaccharide. And it would be, uh, you could do this at any one of the carbons around here. Uh, disaccharide bonds are made by uh, dehydration or condensation reactions. A dehydration or condensation reaction just means you remove a water. When you're removing a water, you create a new bond. So you could remove a water by hooking up uh, any of these carbons to each other. So we could take carbon one and you could bond it to carbon three. You could take an OH group off here, an H there, and instead of a bond between those, I could make a one three glycosidic bond. And I could turn this, these individual sugars into a disaccharide, right? 
So that's, that's chemically possible anywhere on this ring. Uh, that doesn't usually happen in your cells, though. We polymerize DNA in a very specific way, and we'll talk about that. But I want you to see, uh, this is actually the beauty of DNA and RNA, is that chemically, they're kind of, I don't know, in a sense, generic, right? You could do a bunch of things with them. In your cell, we polymerize them in a very distinct, repeating way, and that, that's what allows us to carry information. So questions about structure, about chemical properties of these? This probably is all review, hopefully, from organic chemistry. Yeah? Do we need to know, like, do you want us to know it in this way? There's, like, also the boat. Uh, no, I don't care about the, the cis or the trans, the boat or the, what's the other one called? The chair. chair. The chair, yeah. No, don't, don't worry about the stereochemistry or anything like that. We don't have to uh, know like this. I, I just pretend DNA is like a planar molecule unless, I, unless the structure is important, so, okay. yeah. Yeah, so it's easier than organic chemistry. Right? <laughs> okay, so at the heart of DNA are these, these sugars. But in addition to that, we're putting on these things called nitrogenous bases. They're nitrogen-containing molecules that are slightly basic in terms of their chemical properties. Uh, they have a tendency to grab hydrogens. And that's because they've got a bunch of nitrogens in there. Uh, so we're going to take our ribose, or deoxyribose, and we're going to stick a nucleotide. Or we're, we're starting to make it into a nucleotide by adding one of these nitrogenous bases. Um, they're always put on the first carbon. So the first carbon in the ring is always going to be the one that's got the base on it. So if you're trying to name or you're trying to number the carbons in the ring, either look for the oxygen and the one right next to it is going to be the first one, or just look for which one's got the base attached to it. That's going to be the first carbon. Okay, well, that's probably the easier way to to number them. Find the base and then the carbon that it's bonding to. It's carbon number one. Uh, the bases come in lots of different flavors here. Uh, they're all hydrocarbon rings with amine groups in them. So mostly hydrogens, oxygens, and carbons, but with some nitrogens thrown in there. And when we bond the two together, it's just like this. It's basically the same chemistry as if you were making a disaccharide, putting two, um, two sugars together. Instead, we're just taking a base and a sugar and putting them together. But it's removing a water, so it's a dehydration reaction. It's not a glycosidic bond. In fact, I forget what it... Uh, I guess, well, I'm saying on my PowerPoint it is a glycosidic bond. It might be slightly different <laughs> since it's a base and not a sugar, uh, but the same chemistry is happening. Right? So I stick the base on there. Uh, this is when I start calling this a nucleoside. Okay, so this is not a sugar anymore. It's not a nitrogenous base anymore. I've made a new molecule, and this is a nucleoside. You can put any one of the five uh, nitrogenous bases on either one of the sugars. You could, you could put any of these. In terms of the chemistry, you could put a cytosine base, a thymine base, a uracil base. You could put them on a ribose or a deoxyribose, because it's just going on the first carbon. And the difference between a deoxy and a ribose, nothing's uh, different at the first carbon. Right? They're identical. In terms of the bases you find on them in the cell, that's a little bit different. but the chemistry is the same, right? You could stick any one of those nitrogen bases on there. So we have two flavors, two main flavors of the bases. They are either the purines. The purines are adenine and guanine. The second flavor is pyrimidines. And those come in three types, cytosine, thymine, and uracil. You're going to have to commit these structures to memory. So bust out the flashcards, start drawing pictures. I want you to be able to, uh, initially I want you to be able to draw them uh, for the long-term goal of I just want you to be able to recognize them. Um, there won't be often times in your career that you actually have to draw them, but by drawing them, you'll, you'll learn to recognize them better, okay? So be forewarned, first exam, you're gonna have to draw these, all right? Um, the way I remember them is first, it's kind of like a tree pattern in my mind. First I decide, is it a pyrimidine or a purine? And my, my little mnemonic device is, all girls are pure. OK? It might not be true, but it's helpful to think that. <laughs> um, all girls are pure. Adenine, all guanine girls are purines. And the way you remember the structure is they're all wearing a little purity ring. Okay, So 
the pyrimidines have just one ring structure. The purines have the same ring structure here, but they've got an additional purity ring, okay? So a little trick to help you remember. So if you've decided whether it's a purine or a pyrimidine, let's talk about the pyrimidines first. Uh, I start with thymine. Thymine starts with a T, and I like to think of the structure of thymine as kind of being a T or a cross. So you've got this methyl group opposite of the uh, carbonyl over here, so it's making this T, right? Thymine, right? Um, uracil and thymine, so thymine's always found in DNA. Wherever a T would be in RNA, it's replaced by a uracil. And I like to think of uracil as being a thymine that's timid and is not holding its hand up, right? <laughs> so it's just got the, uh, the double bonded oxygen. It doesn't have the methyl group there, right? And then cytosine has got a C, and so this makes me think of more of a C shape, that amine group and the hydrogens up here kind of make the, the molecule bent a little bit more. So if you're looking for mnemonic devices to try and help you remember how to draw these things, uh, if that's helpful, go for it. Um, so those are the bases. Um, I think I've got something. So if I've got a sugar, a ribose, or a deoxyribose and a base, I've got a nucleoside. If I want to make a nucleotide, one that I can actually polymerize together, I need a phosphate group on it. And the phosphate is always found on the fifth carbon. That is the carbon that's on the stem, the carbon up on the little flag. That's where I put my phosphate group, and now I have a nucleotide. Uh, we're going to polymerize DNA together. Um, DNA is not polymerized together by glycosidic bonds, like you'd make a big, long sugar molecule. Uh, it's made by phosphodiester bonds. So putting that phosphate group on there is important for polymerizing it in the proper way. We'll do some basic nomenclature here, and then I'll, I'll take questions. The bases, the nitrogenous bases, uh, I'm just talking about the, the four in DNA here. Adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. They all end in I-N-E, right? That's if you're referring to the base in isolation, okay? Adenine is the base. If I want to talk about an adenine that's in a nucleotide, or I'm sorry, a nucleoside, then I call it adenosine. So I've stuck an O in there, right? O-N-N-S, adenosine. That implies that it's a base and it's hooked up to a sugar molecule. Okay, I'm a nucleoside. And the same rules follow for the other ones. So adenosine, thymidine, guanosine, cytidine. Slightly different in their, in their names. Um, I just want you to be aware of this. It's actually designating something. Uh, I often interchange these, and I just play fast and loose with them. But I want you to notice that they actually are making, uh, it is making a, a molecular difference here. If I have a nucleotide, right, that's, I've got a nucleoside plus a phosphate, you have to tell me how many phosphates are there. So it's going to be the same name as if it's a nucleoside. So it's still going to be adenosine. But if I've got a phosphate on it, I need to say, is it a monophosphate? Is it a diphosphate? Or is it a triphosphate? Okay. Those three forms are going to be very different from each other in terms of the energy that the cell has to put them together. So for instance, adenosine, if it's a nucleotide, it has to, I have to say it's either adenosine monophosphate, and I would abbreviate that uh, AMP, adenosine monophosphate, adenosine diphosphate, or adenosine triphosphate. And that's how many. Now, you could have a quad phosphate. There's no chemical reason why you w couldn't put another one on there. Um, you don't find anything more than triphosphates in cells. So, so this would be for uh, adenosine, right? This would be adenosine monophosphate, diphosphate, triphosphate, so AMP, ADP, ATP. And this ATP is the same ATP powerhouse of the cell, you know, energy carrying molecule that your, your cells use for a lot of reasons. So in your cell, you not only have ATPs, you know, doing work for you, but they're the ones that are actually nucleotides in your DNA. Right? 
And here's a little ATP molecule. Uh, one, two, three phosphates hanging off the fifth carbon that's not in the ring. Right? So there's the ring structure, the fifth carbon, three phosphates. Since you need all four or all five nucleotides, if you're you know, working in a cell and need to make DNA and make RNA, uh, we abbreviate the, all of the nucleotides together as NTPs, so nucleotide triphosphates. That nucleotide triphosphate means any one of the bases are there. It usually connotates, like if I have a solution, and if I have a solution of NTPs, that means I've got a solution of all four base types there. Okay, so you'll see me abbreviate that. Up to this point, we've all been talking just about RNA nucleotides. If it's a DNA nucleotide, you have to indicate that as well. And so we would call them deoxyadenosine triphosphate. So DATP would be the deoxy form. And if I'm abbreviating for all of the bases, it would be DNTP. So. That's a lot to handle, lots of, lots of different names, uh, but I just want you to be clear about, about what we're saying. Right? Questions about nucleotide structure, naming, what I expect, yeah. Um, so the base plus the ribose, you have the names there, but when you have the nucleoside plus the phosphate, yeah. um, they have the same name, but you have to now indicate how many phosphates we Right, have. right. So is that true for thymine, guanine, and cytosine? So it's true for all of them, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, it's the same name if it's a nucleoside or a nucleotide, but if it's a nucleotide, I've got to tell you how many phosphates are there. Yeah, same for all the bases. Yeah? What is the D, D and T, P, and the for? This is just abbreviations. Instead of having to say that I have a, a cocktail or a f solution full of all four of the bases and say, you know, there's DATP, DTTP, D, it's just too many things. So you just abbreviate and you say DNTP. I've got a solution that has all of the triphosphate forms of the four bases. Does that make sense? But it doesn't do anything? It doesn't, it does a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just telling you how I abbreviate things and how you're going to see things abbreviated in the literature and stuff. Okay. Yeah, I mean, all four of those bases we're going to be putting together to make DNA and RNA. But just when you're labeling it, it's too much trouble to write it all out. So you just abbreviate by using an N, just as a placeholder that says any base could be there, or all four of the bases are there. It's just a generic way of saying it. OK. All right, there's the same thing again, right? Here's my nucleoside, my sugar in a base, and then three phosphates on it, monophosphate diphosphate, triphosphate. Um, ATP is an amazing molecule. Um, I'm going to gauge you guys. Do you think ATP has a lot of energy or not much energy? A lot. A lot of energy. That's kind of the typical thing, right? ATP is carrying a lot of energy. Um, it actually, that's kind of a, it's a trick question. It's not really a lot of energy. It's a cool molecule because it has medium energy. Uh, you actually don't want a lot of energy in the cell. If you get a lot of energy release all at once in a cell, it's going to get hot and, you know, that's going to be bad things, right? You get combustion going on. So ATP is an amazing molecule because it's an intermediate form. Uh, it's like the $20 bill of currency in your cell, right? Uh, if you want to go do something, a $20 bill usually covers it, right? You want to go out to dinner, a 20 will cover it. If you got to go to the movies, I don't know, if you go to a... Uh -huh. 3D, IMAX, movie, you might spend more than $20 now, but um, it's a medium amount of currency, right? So it, it, it uh, has the power to, um, to push most reactions in the cell forward. You just need one or maybe two ATPs. Um, so it's like the $20 bill. You can get away with small chunks. We're going to use that energy, that medium amount of energy, to polymerize nucleotides together. So here is a polymer now of nucleotides. We would not call this a, this is not a, well actually here, pop quiz, what's that base? That's the yeah, it's a T, thymine. T. Yeah, so thymine, and this, this is to uh, ATP or uh, adenosines, so this is TAA. 
Uh, this is not a thymine, this would be a thymine mono, thymidine monophosphate, right? If it was a single nucleotide. But it's not a single nucleotide, it's actually bonded to another nucleotide. So this is no longer a nucleotide, this is what we call an oligo or an oligonucleotide. It's a beginning to be a polymer of multiple nucleotides, okay? Uh, I'll usually refer to these as oligos just for short, but oligo stands for just many nucleotides polymerized together. And this one is called a three-mer, indicating it's got three nucleotides in the polymer. So you can have a 10-mer, a 16-mer, a 100-mer, just how many units do you have, right? Now these are put together utilizing the energy that's in ATP, or in this case, it, this guy originally, uh, let's see. This guy didn't need to be an ATP, actually, because he doesn't have a phosphate on his fifth carbon, right? First carbon in the ring is there, second, third, fourth, fifth, and I don't have a phosphate on it, right? Uh, when I put the next nucleotide on, though, that's where the phosphate came from. So when I polymerize nucle nucleotides together, they go through a phosphate, and this is called a uh, phosphodiester bond. Okay. The bond between the carbon the, the bond, the, the phosphodiester bond, actually, it's diester, so there's a bond here and a bond here. It's meaning it's linking the two nucleotides by, this is, it's one, two, three carbon, and it's linking the next one to its fifth carbon, and it's a diester bond because there's two ester linkages that are holding them together through a phosphate intermediate, okay? So it's a phosphodiester bond holding the two sugars together, third carbon to fifth carbon. That doesn't spontaneously happen. <laughs> if you threw a bunch of nucleotides together, nucleotide triphosphates together, they're not gonna just start polymerizing together spontaneously like this. Um, ATP is a great molecule because it's intermediate strength, so meaning it's typically pretty stable in water. If it had a ton of energy in it and you put it in water, it would just start reacting with the water and just decay really quickly, right? If it didn't have much energy at all, you couldn't get them to go together without providing a lot of heat and a lot of energy to force them together. So ATP is wonderful because it's just kind of intermediate. So in solution, it won't really react, but if you get a, an enzyme in there that's going to catalyze the reaction, um, there's enough energy to get the chemistry to happen, okay? The enzyme that does this are called polymerases. There are DNA polymerases and there are RNA polymerases and there's many different kinds of them and we'll talk about those and their distinctions. But just as a generic thing, a, a polymerase is what's going to put nucleotides together in this arrangement, okay? And the beauty thing about DNA too is the chemistry does not dictate the order of nucleotides. The chemistry between these nucleotides is generic. I can put any nucleotide next to any other nucleotide. That is completely generic. And the polymerase determines what the next nucleotide is gonna be, but not because of any chemical properties, right? If I wanted to, I could make a huge piece of DNA or RNA that's just like T, 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 right? And I can replace any of them with any other nucleotide. Uh, which makes this really unique. There's very few molecules in life, in, in organisms, that have the ability to be polymerized in any random or meaningful, <laughs> in, in any way we choose. Uh, if you think about like a tubulin molecule, tubulin molecules, you know, in the cytoskeleton of your cell, it's alpha and beta tubulin that stick together, and then they just repeat after that. Alpha, beta, alpha, beta, alpha, beta, and you make the long, big tubulin molecule. Uh, actin molecules, you only have one kind of actin, you just string it all together and you make just a big rod. Rods don't contain energy, or don't contain information, right? Uh, maybe it contains a length, you know, if I've got a short rod versus a long rod, you know, if we're choosing, you know, I don't know. We're all in a boat, the boat's gonna sink, there's too many people and we draw straws <laughs> to see who's got the shortest one. The short straw could contain information, right? It's either gonna be yes or no, right? <laughs> 
Uh, but here, you can polymerize all different nucleotides together in any order you want, and you basically have a language here. Because the chemistry is generic, you can set it up however you want, and because we've got different nucleotides, we can actually make informative polymers together here. So I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but we'll get to, to information theory in, in a little bit. All right, questions at this point? How you string them together in, uh, in polymers? We just yeah. have to know carbon places. We don't have to understand how they come together to which organic chemistry. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to go into like, you know, electrons, pushing electrons or anything like that. I just want you to know that they're put together by phosphodiester linkages. Oh, uh, I, although I, I forgot to say, this one, this, um, this adenosine, this used to have three phosphates on it. Okay, so it came in as a triphosphate. And when the polymerase put it together with this T, so when I have this T and put this A together, two of the phosphates were cleaved off. And the, only the very closest phosphate to the fifth carbon is the one that stays. Okay, so if I back up, yeah, I'll, I'll repeat it. So it started off as a triphosphate, that A did. When the polymerase put it together, it clipped it off here, and I released two free phosphates. And then it reformed this bond here with the, the, the T that I was starting with. OK? Yeah. So is it the ATP that's incoming that has a specific base? Yeah. It's the incoming one that has the three phosphates on it. And you cleave off two. And then the remaining one, the one here closest to the base mm -hmm. or to the nucleotide, that is the one that's here that's actually participating in the phosphodiester bond. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That that is the ATP, except it's only got one phosphate now. The other two left. So yeah, when you use ATP, when you use the energy of ATP or any of these nucleotide triphosphates, you're using the energy of the molecule itself to put it in the polymer. Right. We're not using ATP as an accessory. Uh, energy form and using that to put it together. So, you know, I used up an ATP to actually put it there. I used up another ATP to put it there. If I put a T next, I'm going to use up a thymine triphosphate and it's going to get used up. And an ATP, a GTP, a TTP, all of them have the same amount of energy. That triphosphate, you could have any base you want over here. That doesn't affect how much energy there is there. So. All of them have equivalent amount of energy, ATP and, and the rest. Um, ATP is just the one that gets used over and over again in other processes in the cell. But any triphosphate is going to have enough energy to get it to polymerize together. Yeah. OK. Uh, so we now have, if you have got short little polymers, we usually call these oligonucleotides. If you start having lots and lots like really huge polymers, we just start generically calling it ribonucleic acid or deoxyribonucleic acid, right? DNA or RNA. So that usually, if you say I have a DNA strand, it usually implies you've got hundreds or thousands of nucleotides put together. If it's a smaller one, you would usually call it a, a, an oligonucleotide. We call it deoxyribonucleic acid. Why don't we call it deoxyribonucleic base, right? There's all these nitrogenous bases in here, and I've told you that those all act in a basic manner. Can somebody think about, just by looking, the answer is actually up here, if you can discern it. Why is this actually? Because it gives off a hydrogen in order to bond with the other phosphate, or the other oxygen? Yeah, it gives off, an, uh, it gives off a hydrogen. Where did, the, where did the hydrogen come from? It's already been lost here. Where's that? OH group. OH group? Where was the OH group originally? That, so it was an OH group. You're right. It was an OH group that lost its hydrogen. And now it's just an O group. It's on the five and three carbons. No, it's not on the carbons. Uh, not, in the, not in the sugars. If uh, I have an oxygen and it loses its proton, what charge is that oxygen going to carry? Negative. Negative. Right here. 
So that, that phosphate group originally had a hydrogen on it. And if you put it in the right environment, that proton will go back on there. But in normal solution, this is what DNA looks like. It's lost that hydrogen on the phosphate. So it's going to be slightly acidic, and it's going to carry a negative charge. Every nucleotide you have adds another negative charge to your molecule. So DNA is acidic, and when it's in solution, in aqueous solution, it's going to be negatively charged, okay? which are two really important properties uh, for manipulating DNA in solution. So along this side, you're going to have all these free oxygens, negatively charged oxygens. And we'll show you the, the other side in a minute. Um, how acid is ribonucleic acid? If you put a bunch of ribonucleic acid in, in a water solution, it's going to be like 6.9 pH <laughs> instead of 7. It's a very, very weakly acidic, so it's not going to... And most of the time in a cell, there's lots of other things in the cell that's buffering, buffering the charges and buffering the pH. So the inside of cells can vary a little bit, but it's basically neutral. Okay. Um, what's the charge between the, on that oxygen that's also bonded to the ring inside? Yeah, that's also, so this oxygen is also going to have carrying a negative charge, or it could also be protonated. Okay. Yeah. So you could artificially change the pH of a, a nucleic acid solution and force those protons back on if you wanted to. But yeah. Does the negative charge, like, help it in any way, like, to turn or, like, DNA or Yeah, the negative charge helps it because it makes it soluble in water. Positive. It makes it soluble in water. Okay. So you want your DNA to be soluble in, in cells. Okay. And a negative charge, uh, water is a polar molecule, and water likes to dissolve charged things, right? You can, you can dissolve salt in water, right? sodium with a positive charge, chlorine with a negative charge. Water loves to dissolve charged things or polar things. So in terms of helping, yeah, I mean, that keeps it soluble in water, and that's, that's what the inside of your cell is, is mostly water. It also helps us manipulate it as well. We get to manipulate it based on its charge. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.